system using this connection to enforce constraints. So in particular, uh, imagine that we have a closed curve in shape space and all this, this means is I'm going to be driving my car, I'm going to turn my wheel to the right, turn it to the left, but when I stop, my steering wheel is going to be back where I started, the rear tire is going to be back where I started. And we want to see what happens to the system. So we take tangents to this vector, plug it into our connection, integrate, and we get an update to our pose. And the in interesting thing that happens in the case of non-holonomic vehicles is that even if we return to our initial shape, the pose of the vehicle might be different. So in the case of parallel parking, even if our steering wheel is in the same position when we're in the parking spot as when we started, the car is actually moved. And this difference in our, in our pose is <coughs> called the geometric phase. And this is really what non-holonomic systems are about. So if you really want to go out and simulate all the phenomena you see in the real world, uh, you're going to have to figure out how to compute this geometric phase because not all real physical systems are holonomic. Um, and as I said, in our case, we're just using a, a linear matrix uh, to encode the connection. So there's still sort of an open question of how do we encode uh, these, this geometric phase? How do we integrate this geometric phase um, for, for, you know, all the systems that we care about? So here's a, a concrete example of a system we can do with a linear connection. Uh, this is a snake board. So this is a lot like a skateboard except that we can rotate the front and rear uh, wheels independently. And the other control we have in our system is we can swivel our hip. And so this causes a change in the momentum of the system which induces a change in the pose. Uh, so this distance that we're traveling along the concrete here, you can think of that as being the geometric phase of this system. Okay, so now that we sort of understand our constraints, let's talk about how we represent these complex configuration spaces that we often see in vehicles. So as you're probably aware, a lot of physical systems have configuration spaces that are curved, not flat. So for instance, a pendulum moves along a circle, not a line or a plane. And well, we could pretend, you know, momentarily that uh, the configuration space of the system is flat, just use vectors to represent it. But the problem is we're going to end up pushing ourselves off our configuration manifold. And then we have to do some trick like project it onto the closest point on the configuration space uh, to get the right appearance. But of course, if you go and compute something like the angular velocity, there's no reason to believe that this projection is going to give you the right answer. So in this case, the obvious thing is, okay, why didn't we just use an angle theta to encode our position rather than x, y? That way we know we can always stay on, on this circle. Um, and this is actually a very simple example of using a Lie group to represent the configuration space of a physical system. So Lie groups uh, were an object of study of the Norwegian mathematician Sophus Lie. And there's a beautiful geometric theory here, but uh, to understand this for the purposes of integration, it's quite simple. All we need to do is say, okay, we're going to express our configuration or our pose by a transformation, like a rotation matrix, rather than Cartesian coordinates x, y, z. We're always going to express our velocities in a body frame. And we're going to use something called the exponential map to update the system. And the reason we do this is just like in the pendulum, we're automatically going to stay in the curved configuration space of our system. We don't have to worry about any sorts of projection after the fact. So let's take the example of a rigid body. We have some reference configuration and we can describe its pose at any time by the transformation, so in this case a rotation matrix, that takes it to its current configuration. And this set of rotation matrices actually is a geometric space called the special orthogonal group. So this is really a Lie group representation of rigid bodies. We can also represent the velocities, uh, the angular velocity, as a matrix. So here we have an angular velocity psi and it's a simply a skew symmetric matrix, so it's an uh, infinitesimal rotation. And once we have our configuration and velocity represented in this way, uh, performing the integration on the Lie group is actually very simple. To get our new pose from our old pose, we simply multiply the velocity times the time step. We plug that into the exponential map, which is going to integrate it over time. And this is actually the same thing for any Lie group integrator, not just the rigid body. So the geometric picture here is we start out so at some point on our curved configuration space on our Lie group. And if we have some velocity C, well, if we just follow that velocity linearly, we're going to end up off the constraint manifold. Uh, so instead, we're going to use this exponential map. It's going to take us along a curved path. 
and give us the right answer. The really nice thing here is that velocities can be integrated just as usual. So nothing changes. All the standard things you do in integrators are the same. Uh, to get the new velocity from the old one, you might do add the time step uh, times the acceleration in forward Euler, for instance. And all the other quantities that we're using, like forces and momenta, they're also still in linear spaces, which is very convenient. So you might say, okay, this Lie group representation sounds great, but if I have some specific vehicle, I have no idea what Lie group to use uh, to represent my pose. So the way you go about this is you go grab a list of common Lie groups on Wikipedia and you say, okay, well, what is my vehicle to? So in the case of the snake board, the front tire uh, can rotate sort of on a circle or a rotation in the plane and same with the back tires and so we have two copies of S1, the circle. And we also know that the, the snake board itself can be at any uh, position and orientation in the plane. So that's going to be the group of Euclidean transformations in the plane, rigid motions in the plane. And so the Lie group for the system is simply going to be a triple consisting of these three simple uh, types of matrices. And the nice thing for all the dynamical systems we care about uh, in, in vehicle simulation is that we can represent these configuration spaces using matrices and the exponential map is simply the matrix exponential. So if you're doing this in MATLAB, all of this stuff, you know, is already coded up for you. You don't have to do any additional work. Okay, so finally, uh, at this point we could stop and say, okay, let's plug in forward Euler and we've got our vehicle integrator. But we're going to try to do a little better job, make our integrators a little bit more robust to things like big time steps and big forces. And so let's take away a, a look at the way we do time discretization for integrators. So usually we start with some equations of motion, F equals MA. Uh, we discretize them in time using something like finite differences and we get an update rule. Uh, so the something that's interesting to realize is that any equations of motion F equals MA are actually something called the Euler-Lagrange equations that satisfy a condition called a variational principle. And we can view the, the, this standard way of coming up with integrators as actually starting with a variational principle, coming up with the equations of motion, and then discretizing them. And this is going to give you standard integrators such, such as Runge-Kutta 4. Uh, but there's, there's another way to go on this diagram, which